but I'd like to say good afternoon and welcome to this session entitled, so you can see there, well, it's changed a bit now, but Public and Stakeholder Participa Participation in Transport Planning and Policy Making. My name is Juliet Foster and it's my job to steer you through what I hope will be a stimulating discussion with our panel of experts. This is also an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and your experiences, so if you agree or disagree with what the panel has to say, then please feel free to let them know. So this is not just a chance for us to talk amongst ourselves. We want you to get involved too, so please don't be shy. Now, I believe that microphones will be available. So if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, just raise your hand. A microphone will be brought to you. Before you ask your question, could you introduce yourself and also give the name of the organisation that you represent? So, now that we've gone through the preliminaries, we can begin with the session. In fact, our guest has arrived. <laughs> That's okay. Manuela had a great excuse, so I'll forgive her on this one. But I want to open things by starting with an ancient proverb which goes, tell me something and I'll forget, show me something and I'll remember, involve me and I'll understand. Now, the speed at which transport networks have evolved over the decades is nothing short of remarkable. A journey which might once have taken a week or even more can now be completed in a matter of hours or perhaps minutes, who knows. In the meantime, technology has intensified the search for more inventive ways to move ourselves and our goods on time, in comfort and with as little stress as possible. To achieve this means that transport planners need to engage with those who stand to gain the most or those likely to be more directly affected by the work that is undertaken. That means actively bringing key stakeholders and the public into that consultation process. There are two ways to do this. You can either do it well or you can do it very badly. Um, when I was talking to um, one of the people behind this conference, Stephen Perkins, we came across a character called Swampy who for a time was very famous in the United Kingdom back in the 1990s. He was what we call a tree hugger. Swampy and his friends were hugging trees because the government decided that they wanted to build a bypass through the town of Newbury, and Swampy and his eco warriors decided to prevent it from happening. It did happen at the end, but the actual bill was a lot more expensive, shall we say, than the government had anticipated. Take into account the following numbers. Um, a handful of environmental activists, it took 600 security guards to arrest them. There were 748 arrests, in fact. And the final bill was £25 million. We worked this out at around $33 million. So that's an example where something goes very badly wrong in the consultation process, and there you have conflict. It is resolved eventually, but at a price. Then there are small examples of the process at work. During the same decade, the 1990s, Market Harbour was one of six British towns selected by the Department of Transport for its bypass demonstration project. The idea was to redesign the town centre after diverting traffic onto a bypass, or as the planners said, an outer distributor road. Workshops and consultations with residents, businesses and other organisations revealed that routes between the different types of shopping experience were perceived as disjointed. Those views, coupled with ideas over where the gateway to the town centre should be located, were incorporated into the final design scheme. The result was a consultative process that produced traffic calming measures and place-making initiatives that fed in line with the public's expectations. Yes, it's a very small example of that consultative process at work, but it succeeded. But what about policies that are supposed to change the behaviour of motorists whilst improving the environment? Can consultation fulfil all or indeed some of those objectives, or are they undermined by the realities of political pressure? Does our scepticism about politics and its role in transport planning weaken the usefulness of the consultation process, perhaps deterring some stakeholders from getting involved? Those are just a selection of the thoughts, the ideas that we'll be exploring, but I'm sure that more, other, more issues will arise, which of course will be discussed by the panel. Let me introduce the panel to you. They are Mons Lomroth, who is the former Swedish State Secretary of the Environment for the Government of Sweden. A very good day to you. Also, Abraham Chegu, who's the Director of Rural and Non-Motorised Transport for South Africa. Good afternoon. 
Also, Raphael Schwarzman, who is the Regional Vice President in Europe for the International Air Transport Association, also known as IATA. A very good day to you. Jay Hak Oh, who is the Vice President of the Korea Transport Institute, otherwise known as COTI. A very good day to you, sir. And also, Monica Zimmerman, she is the Deputy Secretary General of the ICLEI World Secretariat. Panel, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us. Thank you. Just to fill you in on the format, the panel will give individual presentations. I will talk to them afterwards, and at the same time, there will be the opportunity for you, the audience, to put your questions or comments to them. So can I start with the first of our panellists, Wans, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have decided to be the defence lawyer for politics, and in particular for the defence lawyer for good politicians. In general, in my experience, pol politicians listen more carefully to technical experts than technical experts listen to politicians. I used to go to the TRB in, in Washington, Transport Research Board. It struck me after a few years that almost all presentations at the TRB are on what should be done. Almost none are on how are things actually done. I then asked the, a retired president of the TRB why was this so? And his answer was, because how is much more difficult than what? Politics is much more difficult than the technical stuff. Now, public participation, well designed, will give a good addition to a good political process. It will never replace the political process, but it will be a good addition. Ill designed, it will be close to manipulation. So it all depends on how it's designed. I'll have two cases. One is the Öresund link between Denmark and Sweden. This started out as a technical proposal to build a railway tunnel in the north part of the Straits and a bridge, road bridge in the southern part of the Straits. Now, the railway tunnel would have meant that huge number of fr Swedish freight trains for the German market would pass through upper middle class suburbs of Copenhagen. So the whole idea was dead on political arrival. It would never have happened. However, Copenhagen and the Danish politicians faced another problem. They had very bad connections to the Copenhagen airport. So the solution, political solution to that was to build a combined railway and road bridge in the southern part of the Straits, which would solve both the Swedish wish of having a link and the Danish wish to have a, a link, a strong link to the Copenhagen airport. And by that link, the Danish airport also got a much larger, an even larger market. That was really a win-win solution, but one, only once the pol politics had entered into the calculation. My second point is the, my, sec my second case is the Stockholm congestion charges. The expert had proposed congestion charges for, for decades and the politicians were worried, they wavered and they postponed. For a number of peculiar reasons, which I won't go into, a trial was organized. A seven month trial was organized followed by a referendum. And the trial turned out to be, to everyone's, everyone's, every politician's surprise, a huge success, a huge success. And the referendum was positive. So the, the, uh, so the congestion charges were in fact implemented, are still impl and are still there. They are, they are, the geographical area is ex expanded and the rates have been raised and they are now co-financing extensions of the, of the Stockholm metro system. One could have designed another type of referendum and the result would have been no. Public participation, had that occurred before the trial, would in all likelihood have given the answer no because there was no way for either for the public or nor for most other people to actually grasp what would happen once the, once the congestion charges were introduced. 
So these two cases, to me, tell me that politicians and technical experts need to listen much more to each other. You, they should not try to stay. They should not try to say that in the end, everyone will win. Because that is simply not true. Sometimes it's true, but most frequently it's not true. Some win, some lose, and there are very seldom only truly happy outcomes. But that is what politics is about, choosing between different outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lutmans Londruth. Can we move now to the second of our speakers? I'm going to give the floor to Manuela Lopez Menendez. She is the secretary at the National Ministry of Transport for Argentina. Manuela, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, this is something where, where the, the people like me that are in, in office, I, I have been working in the transport sector in the city of Buenos Aires first and now in the federal government, are very concerned about how to, to make people to, to want to be part of the project that we want to, to do. Of course, this is something that is not easy because you have many stakeholders around your projects, especially when we talk about transport, we talk about the people that use those transport, the people that use the same public space where the transport takes place, and the people that live around the place you are planning to do a project. So the first thing or the most important thing for, for, for to decide whether to do something or not is to, to know which are your stakeholders and which could be your, your risks when you decide to, to start a project of this, of, uh, like these ones. And that process sometimes, as uh, they say, is te the technicians don't think about it. They think what should be done and that's what we have to do no matter what. But when you you have politics behind, you have to think how the people, the, your constituency will, will, will define what, you, what we are deciding to do. So uh, we have a very important case, uh, maybe one of the most important in, in, in our city, that was the, the Metrobus of the Nueve Julio Avenue, that was one of the most important avenues. And what we did is that we, we, we thought about all the issues that could come along with the project and who those stakeholders were and what were their concerns and work with all the areas of the government to have answers and solutions to those concerns. Of course, you cannot always uh, uh, be uh, making all the people to be uh, with you in the, in the process, but you have to listen to them. You have to try to convince them that, that what you are doing is something that is good. Uh, sometimes it's not good directly for them because they are not users or, or they are those who are more alike uh, in, in involved in the, in the process, but uh, you need them to be listening what you have to tell them, you have to listen to them. Uh, so uh, in, in the city of Unisai we have uh, people that are in charge of those kind of, of work where they go talk with the neighbors and, and tell them what we are planning to do. And it's very important, as, as I said, that you have the view of what is the, the concern of each of your stakeholders. You have people that are really interested in the environment. They are interested in what happens to the trees, to the public space. You have the car users that their most important value is to go faster to a place so they want the public space for themselves. You have the bus drivers and the bus users that want to have a better public transport. And everything that we do is trying to think in all of those people so that we can bring, bring solutions. And in case we cannot bring solutions because there are some things that you have to do, although there are some people that have, uh, there is a bad outcome for them, is to make them be part of the process and explain them why something has to be done. And that, that, that we did in, in, in the city is very important for what we are doing right now in other cities around the, the country because 
maybe in our countries you have one city that is the, the mirror of the others. Clearly, our capital city is, is the mirror of all the other cities. And so it, all the experience we have from Buenos Aires city is very important to show other peoples what, is, uh, what, what we can do with them, what our, our, their concerns, what, how did we uh, uh, solve the problems that almost every city have so that we are able to, to have, to, to, to meet, reach our goal that is to, to change the way people travel and to, to have better transportation in our cities. Thank you very much. Can I now introduce our third speaker, Abraham Chego. He is the Director of Rural and Non-Motorised Transport in South Africa. Abraham Chego, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to talk to you briefly about how we do public participation in my country, South Africa. So probably most of you know that South Africa is a constitutional democracy with three tiers of government. We've got local government, provincial government, and the national government. All of these uh, spheres of government are responsible for particular areas of work within their jurisdiction. So they are able to come up with laws and policies that applies to them. And also we've got national government that is constituted of National Assembly and National Council of Provinces. And also we've got the executive, which is the president of the republic, deputy president and his ministers. So in South Africa, we try our best to consult with the public. And that also we consult with our politicians through the process that I've mentioned now. And our constitution says that it is important for us to consult with members of the public and those who will be affected by the services that we are going to introduce in various cities and provinces. So we, from our side, recently we've been involved with roads policy that we are currently consulting with the members of the public. We have consulted with various government departments. We are now at a stage where we will be taking that policy to cabinet for them to approve for it to be gazetted so that we can go out and consult even more with private sector and also ordinary members of the public. And once that project process is completed, then we can uh, integrate the comments that we think are relevant to the document and then from there we should be able to take it back to government for final approval. So we've got various stakeholders that we talk to depending on projects that we are implementing. We talk to business, civil society, NGOs, and ordinary members of the public, as well as some of the institutions that were set up by government. I'm just going to also share with you two examples of projects that we implemented in South Africa, which are a classical case of public participation. Some of them would say are very successful, and one would say we are still grappling with the challenges that uh, emanated from that project. Uh, the first project that I want to talk about is Reavaya Bus Rapid Transport system in the city of Johannesburg. This is a project where the city of jo Johannesburg wanted to introduce bus system in the city in order to assist the population there with regards to better movement within the city and also to reduce congestion and make sure that public transport is improved. But there were a number of challenges there. Uh, the, the routes that the bus system wanted to take over were operated by taxis. As you probably know in our country, taxis are very much uh, organizations that do not want to have their livelihood threatened by anybody. So once the city approached them about this project, they were very much unhappy. But the city of Joburg tried to show them reason that all of them will benefit from this project. Because uh, the city was also very, uh, they wanted everybody to be involved. So that at the end of the day, taxes can benefit Members of the community can also benefit, but Texas had to be convinced how best can they benefit. So uh, they were involved in the processes from inception and they were told that uh, once they agree with this particular project, they will be made part of the ownership of this particular project. So they will be form, they will form part of the shareholding of the business. Currently, as we speak in the city of Joburg, we've got a company called Pio Trans, which is running this service. They are in partnership with the city of Joburg. And then this pure trans company is made up of taxi, former taxi owners. So they are now in business. They are owning real business. They are shareholders, business with governance, and also members of the, of, of, of the public are benefiting from it. 
And this particular group of uh, taxi operators, they represent about 18 taxi associations in the area. So all of them get uh, dividends on a, as and when they agree how they pay them out. So everybody benefits. And also, like this project has been a, quite a huge success. Now they are even assisting other cities to say ourselves from the city of Jobek as, as taxi op op operators who have agreed to participate in this project, we are benefiting, you can also do the same. So other cities followed through after that, the city of uh, Tswane, city of Cape Town, they've got their own uh, bus rapid transport system and they're trying to follow the same system that happened in the city of Johannesburg because it was uh, our first time in the country to, to involve taxi operators in this kind of business. So we think that this is a very successful project and then we are very proud of it and then we try to share with other cities that are interested. But it's not like we don't have problems. They still have challenges here and there, but majority of the cities are doing very well. And the other project that I want to speak to you briefly about is the Gauteng Highway Improvement Project. Oh, sorry. Normally, it's referred to as Houghton Freeway Improvement Project, or in, we call it GFIP in our country. It's the project that we like. It was implemented around 2010, during the uh, Soccer World Cup days. It was meant to improve the city. I mean, the highways in Houghton, cutting across t t three cities: it's Johannesburg, um, City of Ekurhuleni, as well as Tswane. Those are some of the major cities in Houghton. So what happened here is that it was about upgrade of the highway, adding more lanes, and also ensuring that the service of the road is improved. And then government thought it was uh, a very good idea for them to, over and above paying the project with our fiscals, we thought maybe it's important to also get the members of the public to pay for it via user pay principles. So we introduced the concept of e-tolling to, to ensure that we pay through that uh, particular system. Uh, public participation was conducted for this project, but uh, members of the community and other interested groups were very unhappy about it. So there were a lot of complaints and protests that happened there. People were not uh, like uh, interested to take over and pay as we expected them to. But I just want to indicate that in South Africa, uh, tolling is very successful in other areas. It could be that with this one, maybe it was more the method of collection than the tolling itself. Because if you know our roads, the N1 and the N4 and N3, we use, these are the national roads, the long distance national roads, we use tolling and then people are paying. Maybe it was more on the collection side of things. And then they complained, there were protests, matches, and then we went back to uh, conduct public participation again. We even involved the I mean, deputy president of the country to, 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 to do that, as well as the premier of Houting took it upon himself to also go out and consult. But still, even currently, we are still experiencing some problems, but we are learning from it. We just wanted to show members attending here that we've got successful projects that we have done in terms of public participation and those that we are grappling with and we are learning from. It's important that we involve members of the community or those who are affected by the service that you want to introduce from the very beginning and that way you can be able to achieve your objectives. Thank you very much. Much. That was Abram Chego. Can we now move to our next speaker, Monica Zimmerman? She's the Deputy Secretary General of the ICLEI World Secretariat. So I think you want to do, would you like to speak from the podium or? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, ICLA is a global network which includes around 1,500 local and regional governments and all of them together would have around 20% of the urban population. So what we do is we support our members in their development towards sustainability. That is including low carbon development, resilience, resource efficiency and eco-mobility. So eco-mobility is what we say is the giving priority to walking, biking, public transport and shared mobility, but reducing the relevance of the cars in the cities. And you can imagine that there is a certain uh, conflictual discussion included in that. So I want to speak from a very local perspective and I really want to speak in favor of well done public participation processes, because we definitely believe in it. And it was ICLEI who has developed the so-called Local Agenda 21 approach 25 years ago, and we are all still benefiting from that. By the way, all the cities which had been mentioned so far are very active ICLEI members, and we are grateful for their contributions. So I think there are very different types of projects when we discuss what public participation is. There can be single 
uh, infrastructure projects, such as which had been mentioned, which often are perceived as, as having a lot of conflicts. There can be innovative testing projects, urban labs as we now call them, and again, there, there is a need of a very specific way of involving the public here. But I would like to speak about a third type, and this is more the long-term vision building and planning processes. So we call our members and many other cities for doing sustainable urban mobility plans, which are extremely relevant now because the entire urban mobility planning has to be renewed anyway from time to time. But now in these years, we have to ensure that the principles of sustainability sustainable development goals as one keyword, and low carbon development, Paris Agreement, very relevant today as another keyword, so that all this is taken up and integrated into this planning. Uh, by the way, we should mention that the transport sector, including the urban transport, is a sector in which CO2 emissions are still growing, which is a high concern for us. So public and uh, stakeholder involvement in all these types of processes is very relevant for a variety of reasons and I'm happy to share some with you in a second. Leaving public involvement out or doing it badly will cause high costs, often political problems and time delays later. So do it at the right time in the right way. We have been sitting here together with around 30 cities in the last days for a specific meeting of the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative, TUMI, which has been started by the German Federal Ministry for cooperation, Economic Cooperation. And many of the cities, Addis Abeba, Buenos Aires, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Rosario, Frankfurt, Lagos, Windhoek, whatever, have been there. And while their mobility challenges are different, the relevance they give to public participation, I think, is rather similar. So, first message I want to share with you is, for successfully transforming urban mobility systems towards sustainable urban mobility systems, and that's a task what all cities in the world have ahead of them, these processes are closely linked to spatial planning and to strategic urban development. So this is about long-term visions, about development passes, about values, priorities, something very essential for communities. And therefore we say one reason, uh, including citizens in their different roles, be it as user or as being affected, including interested businesses, again, being the user of an infrastructure or providers of services, or be it other stakeholders, research, NGOs, media, national authorities is absolutely clear. In our eyes, the public authorities should lead such processes, best the local government, but they have to be managed professionally. So let me give you six other strong reasons why such a public and stakeholder involvement <laughs> is to the benefit of all of us. First, many local cases demonstrate clearly that well-planned and professionally managed participation brings amazing results. Example, the city of Dresden, not far from here, reported about a five years planning process for their new general mobility plan. And at the end, with all types of stakeholders, and at the end, they could unanimously adopt new mobility goals for that city, along which now they can do their action plans. Second reason. Time and efforts invested early and properly pays back. There is a higher consensus, there is often faster implementation, which is also cost relevant, and there are more co-benefits, other issues which we solve at the same time. Third, not involving the public and the stakeholders present often a risk of failure, and this is even often unnecessarily. So the project could have been much better advanced, but once a public... Um, opposition starts for, for often other reasons than the project itself, uh, the capacities go into that struggle rather than into finding good solutions. Fourth uh, strong reason is that all experience shows that if groups are involved early in development planning and, and general um, uh, looking ahead, uh, are then much better prepared for being involved in the implementation to make the plans a success. I think you have seen that in Buenos Aires very well. For example, this can be very relevant to include business stakeholders when you are going to make a new uh, low-carbon urban freight 
uh, planning and system. Fifth, public participation can anchor long-term visions and goals in the local and the regional decision makers making beyond electoral periods. I think we discussed that, that's often a problem. Short periods, new government comes in place, what happens with the long-term uh, plans, even infrastructure plans. So anchor it with your stakeholders and it can last much longer. And finally, solutions themselves become oft better and richer in the ways on how they are uh, because many stakeholders have added their ideas. I'm very happy to later share some success factors, but I think the reasons are key at the moment. We'll hear those, obviously, but thank you so much for that, Monica Zimmerman. Can I now move on to uh, Jai Hak Oh. He is the Vice President of the Korea Transport Institution, also known as COTI. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Julia. Uh, I, I would like to introduce about a particular but quite successful uh, story on how to resolve the conflict of stakeholders uh, and to finally to get to the uh, very uh, uh, what is a regional uh, decision making uh, the, of the uh, uh, around the site selection of the, a new airport uh, in the southeast region of Korea. Uh, from now on, I will very quickly read through because of time. I think it's uh, quite often many infrastructure projects are faced with a strong opposition from the, uh, from the people due to their negative impacts such as the aircraft noise. Uh, however, uh, also there are some cases uh, to favor such infrastructure project, mainly in, uh, infrastructure project in the regional or local city level mainly because of the fact that the budget and investment for the, the infrastructure construction are supported 100% from the central government. So the, uh, the, the new uh, airport in, in southeast region of Korea was a quite unique project in that the, uh, the, what is the actually the, this project is the later, later case and uh, means the uh, please, not NIMBY, but the PIMBY case, please uh, uh, put in my the backyard, something like this. In that, the five regional government, many regional government, uh, which is the divided into two groups. So in this case, we have three stakeholders. One is the Busan city, and the, the other, the second stakeholder is the, the rest poor, poor, what is the, the, what is the local, the government, and finally the uh, last one is the central government. But in, in principle, central government is quite neutral. Okay, uh, something kind of the coordination, uh, the coordination role uh, for the project. Uh, so the, uh, in between the uh, very fierce competition, regional uh, serious political conflict was uh, surfaced which was an un unprecedented case in Korea. So this project already, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, it, 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 it became the, quite seriously the political issues already. So it's the, the, the many people are much concerned about that. Uh, to accommodate approximately 38 million passengers in the future annually, through and through the, uh, the expert and advert, advertise and the consultation, uh, the, the final, a final the short list uh, as three options. Uh, the island, the Gadok, Gadok Island site, uh, which is an uh, island site, is, uh, which is, of course, is the very high cost uh, and also is very difficult to, 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 to have uh, the access transport. Uh. But the good thing is the, the, the very uh, little the noise problems. And the Miryang area, Miryang is located in the, in the mountainous area, in the, in the middle of the region. So it's a better access, less, uh, less the, what is the construction cost. But problem is uh, some the, uh, the, what is the aeronautical barrier problems. Eh? And the final one is the expansion of the existing airport. 
So it's three uh, candidates, uh, three, three candidates of the size elections. Uh, in order to prevent uh, political intervention and coming up with a rational conclusion, the government has invited five regional government representatives uh, discussed on the decision-making process and finally reached an agreement uh, signed by the, uh, the agreement on the, the on rules the rules and the process of the of the decision making signed by the all the parties, all the stakeholders. The first first thing is the based on the agreement, uh, five parties were able to monitor process thereby increasing transparency of the project. Also, through check and balance system stated in the agreement between government and the five parties, they were able to monitor each other's activity against the in independence for the study. Thus, the central government has advised the parties that if their rules agreement were violated, the party will be notified for their unfair action. And based on agreement, secondary, in order to maintain transparency, objectivity, and fairness of the project while reducing the conflict between the parties, government has invited experts from the outside of the country. Evaluation criteria and methodology of the study, which is very sensitive to the uh, evaluation, the site selection evaluation, was reviewed by the international experts, ex experts through the OECD ITF roundtable. Now the final report is available in the I ITF website. You can you can read it. Uh, also, the government has invited five parties to express their opinions, progress of the project, and thus the go the government has allowed the parties to accompany even their experts of the choice to check and review the project result. And finally, uh, the, in order to prevent any political interference or issues, the government has carefully planned the time schedule for the final announcement, for example, the avoiding some election event, something like this, decide to avoid any regional elections period and other politically sensitive data. In conclusion, the project has ended successfully with a full agreement. It is an important word, a full agreement on the final result, which is the expansion of the existing airport. Thank you very much for your listening. Okay, thank you very much, Ju. That was Jay Hack O oh, of the Vice President of the Korea Transport Institution. And uh, the last speaker, institute I should say, the last speaker is Raphael Schwarzman. He is the Regional Vice President for Europe for the International Air Transport Association, otherwise known as IATA. So continuing with the aviation theme, Raphael. Thank you. And, uh, and um, as you said, I'm, I'm representing air transport. Um, and for us, obviously, uh, the topic of public and stakeholder participation um, in transfer uh, planning and policy making is, is extremely critical. Um, as it was even highlighted by earlier in the, in the plenary, I think, by the Minister of Transport from Singapore, where he actually highlighted the need for open, efficient, and global uh, standards and regulation in this area, because obviously this is global in nature. So in terms of, 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 of policy around the world, there is a lot of divergence and disagreements, but uh, we are seeing more and more that governments, international organizations and businesses um, are, are looking for good regulatory practice or what we like to call in IATA smarter regulation. Um, and we believe that by adopting this uh, approach, smarter regulation, it, it does unlock, in the case of the aviation and not exclusively aviation, uh, the potential of, of this industry. And just to, 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 to get a feel for it, I mean, for the last 60 seconds that maybe I've been speaking, um, aviation has, has actually carried 12.2 uh, million uh, in wood, on goods, right? It, about 6,000 passengers have boarded an aircraft and 4.6 million of economic activity was supported. So, and this is just 60 seconds. Now, if we look at, if we look at um, the projections, and, and, and we projected that by 2034, um, aviation will account for about 99.1 million jobs and 5.9 trillion in GDP. But obviously, this is, this is not a guarantee uh, thing. Um, and, 
a reduction in 1% on growth annually will have an impact of 10.5 million jobs and a reduction also of 1 trillion of GDP activity. So I guess one way to ensure this growth is through good regulation um, that delivers clearly defined measurable policy objectives with the lowest burden to all. Now, for, <coughs> sorry, the foundation to smart regulatory practices is what is, has already, I think, been mentioned already a few times, is consultation. Um, cost, proper cost-benefit analysis need to be done, and they need to be proportional, right? And we need to look for unintended consequences. We need to look what is the effect on the economy. I think it was, there were some cases already mentioned. I will mention in the case of, of, of the air transport industry, um, the passenger tax examples of the Netherlands and Ireland, where uh, this tax was implemented, and after looking at the revenue and passenger growth reductions, they were taken away a year later. So consultation is critical to, us to properly assess the impact by government, um, as it was said. Now, consultation can also prevent or alert uh, potential um, uh, discriminatory effects, right? And again, this is not exclusive to aviation, but for example, discrimination between either foreign and domestic carriers, or even discriminations between mo modes of transport where um, one mode of transport will be, let's say, paying for its infrastructure, while other modes of transport will be uh, paid by the government, right? So this is something that we need to look carefully. Now, consultation, what might also unlock uh, other smarter regulation principles. And if we get it right, right, policies, plans, um, and, and we get this right level of interactions with the communities and stakeholders, uh, we, we, we can have a sustainable growth in transport. Now, one thing not to forget when we discuss all this is, is the impact of technology. You know, the technology is changing the way we are able to process and manage everything in transport. I heard that in, in other panels today, and I think that's something uh, not to overlook. And then, thanks, and I look forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you there from Rafael Staltzman. He's the Regional Vice President of Europe for the International Air Transport Association, otherwise known as IATA. Number of points arising from what the panel said just now. I'm just going to pick out a selection of them. Um, for, for example, um, it's important to ID, in other words, identify your stakeholders. In the case of South Africa, um, it is written into the constitution to have consultation. The South Korean experience, PIMPI versus NIMBY. Please, in, in PIMBY, I should say, please in my backyard against not in my backyard. Leaving out consultation is expensive, especially in the long term, and also the need for smart regulation. It's happening in the, uh, the aviation sector. We can see examples of it happening in sectors outside of that. But also it's important about politics. It's inevitable, but it's the way that it is played. So plenty there to think about. But what all of these experiences reveal is that the process is really ever straightforward because you have competing interests and multiple needs. So I don't really know who wants to tackle this question first, but doesn't that risk undermining the integrity of the process? So many actors on the stage, all competing to be heard, to direct the play. Who wants to tackle that? So we go for, for Muz first, and then we can go for Abraham or whichever. Let, let, let me give one shot at it. I think the experience is that some stakeholders have, have almost always been involved, but others have not. The, in general, what, I'm, what I would be worried about are quote unquote unholy alliances between politicians, technical experts, and some stakeholders. It's what we, I cut my first teeth in, in local politics by opposing a series of urban motorways in the city of Stockholm in the 19, in late 1960s, dreamed up by perfect plans by the technical experts with no consideration whatsoever of what would be the politics of imp implementing them. So of course these plans were scrapped and all for the better for the city of Stockholm. 
So who were involved in that? Well, the technical experts, the, the car industry, the construction companies, and so on and so forth. And the only way to, the only way to, to block it was actually to, um, well, what, what, what was then called outer, parlia outer, outer parliamentary activities, which we did successfully, I might add. So it's the unholy alliances one should be wary about. And you should always be very careful to look at the unholy alliances of proposals. Who's in favor and why? And then, of course, if it's well designed, you can design a, consul a consultative process which, involve, which involves more aspects to it. But there will always be insiders, insider stakeholders in these processes. Okay, and uh, Abram, I think you wanted to address that. And then, and then af after Abram, please. Okay, thank you. I just want to say, uh, mention a few things that I think are critical to stakeholder consultation. If you look at the case of the city of Johannesburg, uh, there are taxi drivers involved there. There are taxi owners involved in this project. Once you start threatening their livelihood and, that they, they, and they don't understand what's going to happen to them, they are likely to react negatively. So it's important for the project implementers to analyze their stakeholders accordingly so that they know who might be uh, impacted by the project negatively and want to disrupt the project before it can even start so that they explain to those people what is it that they want to do and how are they going to benefit from this project because people thought we were going to lose jobs so the best way is to disrupt this and make sure that it doesn't take off but they were informed that no no we're going to take you in you're going to be part of the system you're going to benefit and this is going to be more efficient system that we're going to run even your commuters are going to be happier so by the time you show them reason, then people start to get involved. But if you think you can just uh, uh, maybe try to pull wool over their faces, that's where the problem might happen. So, so, so try to be very inclusive yeah, in, yeah. in, in the and process. Uh, yes, even those that maybe you think are not very important, but as long as they've got impact on the project, you must involve them. And also you must navigate the terrain very carefully because here we've got other interested parties some of the people will be coming in for their own uh, interest to disrupt so that they can continue benefiting. So you must just be careful about how you do the analysis, right. make sure that everybody who's affected is informed so that they can see you. Okay, they I want can to see that everyone's nodding vigorously in agreement. I know that you wanted to respond to my question, Jai Hak O, oh, about undermining the integrity of the process if you've got so many people involved, pandering, if you like, to these multiple okay, needs. Okay. I, I think Juliet mentioned the new airport project is kind of the PIMB project. I think usually uh, when we uh, the evaluate the construction project, whether it is uh, the good or bad, based on some cost-benefit analysis or some multi criteria analysis assessment, but that those the evaluation is based on the, some national level or some the very macro level. Some quite often, there are the winners and the losers, of course, for every project. You see, so in the case of the Yongnam, in the in the case of the airport sel, the site selection project, there is some the minority, the residents, who are not happy with this project, but the, at this stage, they are very silent because of the regional the interest or the local level whole interest. But the important thing, what I wanted to say is the from the beginning, we have to pay attention on the interest of the minority, which is related to the losers. That is the key issue to be successful for the project consultation. Okay. okay, and yeah. Monica, I know that you wanted to respond to that as well. I absolutely agree, and I would go a step further. Not those who are the loudest are the most relevant, or those who provide the best contribution to solutions. And I would say a good, well-done stakeholder participation aims at finding consensus and at finding something which works for as many as possible, and not necessarily starts by saying we have always conflicts or we have always an either or. But then we need a very well-managed process, which must be very transparent. The, those being involved 
from the beginning onwards need to know what is the relevance of that process. Is it more to give advice? Is it involved in decision making? They want to know whether it is relevant to spend their own time or money or whatever in that process. And it shall never be fake. We should never do as if you let people participate participate or organizations, but actually you do not want it. And I think Mann said it very, very clearly. Uh, people and organizations are very sensitive if something is wrong in the, pro in the process. And then it can go towards protest, which is completely different from participation. Hmm. Manuela, I'd like to put this point to you because the, the experience that you had in Buenos Aires, it was very positive. You consulted with people, you got a result. People felt involved from the beginning, they listened. That's fine, but what if people don't feel they can engage with the consultation process, regardless of how transparent it is? Because unfortunately, there is an inbuilt skepticism that some communities have with big projects and the hand of government directing things. Yes, as you said, the most important thing about uh, consultancy or getting people involved is transparency, is telling the people the truth about the project, the truth about the outcomes of the project. Uh, and of course, some of those outcomes are negative to some stakeholders. So uh, governments are always willing to, to say the good things, not the bad things. But I think that the, the most important thing is uh, confidence. Uh, the, the work of being with the neighbors, being with the people, talking with them, understanding their problems, and trying to find solutions is part of, of the role that local governments have, local officials have. When we go to see neighbors, we talk with them, and at the end, most of the times, their, own con their concerns or their problems can be solved in another way. Sometimes, the, what, when they see possible important changes in, in, in their way of life, they think that the problem is there, and when you start talking with them, when you start explaining, you see that the problem is somewhere else, and you can help them to, to solve it. Maybe uh, I remember a case in, in one of our BRT that was related with public space. We, we, were, uh, in, we needed to, to use a small part of a, a big park for, for the stations the BRT. And the truth is that w when we started talking with the neighbors, their problem was the lack of a good public space, not the the, the problem was, wasn't the part of this public space where we were discussing, but the lack of public space for years in that area. So what we finally did with them is to define how could we do better public space, how we could get neighbors and people involved in looking after those public space after we did the, the investment, because that's, that was their own concern, that there was very bad public space because people didn't care about it. So we work a lot with them, with the public space area of the government, and now, six, four years after, we have very good public space, and the BRT in, in the place, and neighbors at the end were very happy with, with the decisions we made together. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget as well that we do want you to get involved in this discussion. It's not just us amongst friends, so to speak, but it's the opportunity for you to put your questions and comments to our panel. I'd like to throw out one more question and then it's open to you guys. But very, very briefly, I mean, look, it is good to have information. That is part of the pub public consultation process along with the key stakeholders. But isn't there a time when perhaps too much information creates a bit of a data cloud and it just keeps people away because they just feel completely blitzed by things. So it may have the opposite effect. Who'd like to tackle that? A preponderance of information. Rafael. Well, I, I mean, this is, this is a very, um, I think, a very difficult balance to strike. I mean, there were, uh, one thing that I will also clarify is that um, when we talk about stakeholders, uh, I think uh, we need to be very careful. It is not just about um, I would say examples of the general public, and, and I, I have an example for ex when I was thinking of um, uh, in, in the EU there was a discussion, uh, uh, you know, there was a dossier about the package uh, travel directive, which was uh, uh, passed in November of 2015, and that was under DG Justice, right? Um, and, you know, the, the, it was, it, the intention was right, I mean, in terms of responding to 
changes in the travel market to, uh, uh, you know, for distortions that were caused by the internet. But, in, uh, you know, there was no inclusion in that discussion of DigiMove, which is where transport is, right? So, you know, travel packages include transport and all that. So, and obviously aviation is under that, but it's not only aviation. So, I, I think it's, it shows how di difficult it is, actually, to address that question. And, and I guess um, it, it is very important in that sense that, that, you know, you do have very, I mean, a, a, a very independent view of what needs to be addressed, right? Because if you are somewhat biased towards or influenced towards, I don't know, you know, a, a specific body or something, then you will always consult with, you know, the close circle of, of stakeholders that are linked to that. And, and therefore, that independence is very important. How do you, how do you get a bit independent from and, and, you know, bias towards that action that you need to take? And I think uh, that's very important. And that's why I use that example that, you know, sometimes we, we tend to think in a very limited mm -hmm. scope. And some of these discussions that we're having here, they go from local examples of the Buenos Aires uh, case, for example, to a global impact like an airport, right? So in, in that case, you even need, you know, we actually recommend, you even need to even have uh, the consultation done probably in English, so you would have stakeholders internationally to be able to input you, because I can give you the example of, of Heathrow, but you have 82 airlines operating at mm. Heathrow. So they're part of that consultation process too? Well, they should be, right? Mm. Because they, 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 they need to be involved. Sure. I, I know that, Mars, you wanted to, 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 to address that point as well. So if we could pass the microphone along and then afterwards, I'd like to take questions from the audience. I would, I'm all for public consultation, well, des well designed. But if you look at the, the average household in a city with children, they're asked to, do, to be consulted in schools. They're asked to be consulted in the housing area where they live. They're asked, they're asked to be consulted here and there, here and there, and there, and there, and there. Don't expect most people to actually have the time to get involved in public, in, in public consultations. Some will, but it's not, it's not all that clear that the ones that actually do participate are that representative of the population. So I think there are limits to the usefulness of public consultation. And as long as one is aware of those limits, it's fine. Okay, so limits to, the, to use, the, the usefulness of a public consultation process. Is there anybody who would like to address that point and indeed some of the others that have been raised so far? The gentleman over there, could you please, the, mic the microphone's on its way, if you could introduce yourself and the organisation that you represent. Yeah, hi, I'm Richard Cross from the Ministry of Transport in New Zealand. Um, just building on that last point um, around kind of the limits of, of uh, public consultation, it, it strikes me that it's 2017 and we're having a panel discussion around public participation and policy making and I haven't really heard much about the opportunities to use social media to reach a far broader audience. And I wondered if anyone in the panel wanted to comment on that in terms of the, the opportunities, but also some of the challenges and, and risks associated with that. Okay, in thank actual you. fact, that was one of the subjects which I did, Mark, so thank you for preempting me there. But a very good point, in fact, social media in that consultation process and also the challenges that that presents. So who would like to tackle that one first? Would you like to go for that, Monica? The most relevant is that the process is, as we said, inclusive and transparent. If social media contribute to that or are an impact of that, fantastic. But we should, of course, be careful that they are not getting exclusive to other parts. I, mean, I understand that some parts of population are much easier to reach, and this is fantastic, and involving youth, for example, is, should be one of our major goals in whatever uh, such processes. But it should then also not exclude others. So I see it as an addition, as an additional way, on, or a way in which, in which we should combine with the more classical uh, participation processes which we have. Hmm. And Abram. Okay, thank you. I just want to comment to that, maybe talking about consultation channels. I think it's important that you can use social media depending on who the stakeholders that you are targeting are. Like in our case, for example, like uh, 
if maybe you're dealing with a group of uh, middle-aged men who did not like go through education up to those levels and do not use social media that much, you must know how to talk to them and also how to access them and which channels you have to use to access those people. So I think the best thing is to say, know your stakeholders, know which channels you should use to, to, to reach them. Could be, if it's media, know which radio station they listen to. If maybe you are targeting young people, then you can use social media and depending also on the access to internet. Because there could be places where you want to conduct some kind of stakeholder consultation, but maybe they don't have access. Mm. Look what, 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 what you can use to reach your audience. That's all that I can say. Mm. I, and good point, because the, the other point which actually sprang to mind off the back of this gentleman's question is, is the issue about data security, because some people may feel reluctant to get involved in these things online because of the amount of information they have to surrender about themselves. And as we have discovered to our cost, no system is hack-proof. So how do, you, how do you tackle that if you want, if, if perhaps the media or the, the, the new technologies is perhaps the most viable, effective way of, of reaching some people? What's your, what's your take on that, Raphael? Well, I, I think uh, um, in terms of social media, it's either even if you, if you don't want to use it, you are still being impacted by it. So it's not actually, you know, one thing is to go and do a, a specific consultation over social media, but you, even if you don't do it, you still are impacted on the, on the opinions and, the, and, and, and everything. You know, we have seen things going viral and they can, they can take a life of their own, right? So I think, um, uh, the, 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 in, in the case of obviously, um, I guess, data protection and, 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 and privacy laws, um, I mean, it, it is a bit unavoidable, I would say, to, to, to have to use it. And that's why I mentioned when I made my introduction uh, that the, not to forget the impact of technology on everything we do in, I mentioned in transport, obviously it's not only transport, uh, and social media is one of them, right? So everybody's connected. Um, if you want to mobilize a community in a good way or in a bad way, you can be mobilized in that community using social media. So um, I, I, I think you need to take the, 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 the preventive actions necessary, not only in terms of are you going to use social media, but you, you have mm -hmm. to take into account social media no matter what nowadays. Sure. Uh, can, can I take it back to the gentleman who asked the question, what is the New Zealand experience of this? Is it quite common to actually use the internet and other forms of new technology in decisions over transport? Um, I would say... Can we have his microphone on, please? Hello. Great, uh, we can hear you. I, I would say we, we do use it quite extensively in just about every policy proposal that we put out, we will have some element of engagement through social media. But I think there are, we sometimes struggle to know how to use it. Uh, from my, my perspective, I think the key advantage is that it allows you to reach a lot of people, but there's a big risk in that uh, often all you have to do is click a button to support mm. or oppose a proposal, and it's, uh, you don't have to be as invested as you did when you had to write a letter or go and meet, to some, meet someone face to face. Uh, so I think it's, it's trying to understand the weight to put on it. It's, it's so prone to, to misinformation. Someone can mm. uh, write a tweet encouraging you to go onto a website and click a button supporting or opposing a, a policy and you don't have the complete information. So I think those are some of the challenges we're, we're thinking about. It's, it's how to make it work in a constructive way. <laughs> but it sounds like you guys are hooked. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But, uh, yeah, lots of issues, I think. And keen to see, see a, a way that we can make it work really effectively. Sure. OK, then. I mean, is there anybody else who'd like to address that point about the internet as a way of getting people involved? Or indeed, are there other points which people would like to raise? Could, is anybody, would anyone like to put a question to the panel at all? Gentleman over there, the, the gentleman over there first, and then the gentleman in the white shirt. But this gentleman here, if you could introduce yourself and the organisation you represent, uh, please. Barry Cleary, National Transportation Authority. Um, sort of a couple of thoughts. Uh, certainly, historically, in the Irish context, a lot of our consultation is done um, kind of at remote from people. And I was conscious of the thought about busy people and um, placing yourself in the way of the people in their in their daily activities. I've seen some stuff from New Zealand uh, uh, where the consultation is run on the main shopping street. 
um, looking for people's opinions to actually go out. There's also a piece where, and the lady from Argentina kind of struck this with me, was, uh, are we consulting on the right thing? What is the actual piece that we're actually going to allow the public to influence? Because oftentimes we do consultation and actually we're going to do it anyway. Um, and you know, we're just out there to kind of get through the motions of doing these things and not allowing for the public to actually have the influence. So there's no integrity. You're just going through the motions of it, yeah. but you've already made your mind up. Yeah, I mean, are, are you consulting about the right part? So you, you're out with a scheme to do something, but you've already dealt with that earlier on. The actual detail is about how it's going to affect or how you're going to adjust it within the context of, so in the case of the public space, we're going to fix public spaces or some local issues, but we're not taking the scheme away and being direct about what it is that you're doing um, and carrying that through from the strategic to the, to the local piece. So it sounds like a sleight of hand. Would anyone like to respond to that before we give the microphone to the gentleman in the white shirt? Would anyone care to? Raphael. Well, I mean, it's, it's very short, actually. I mean, it, 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 one critical part of consultation is it cannot be an exercise of just uh, ticking the box. So, you know, if, if that's, that's the case, then obviously mm. no then credibility, what's the point no of it? trust, and then mm. there's no point to it. Yeah. Okay, then, the gentleman in the white shirt, if you could introduce yourself and the organization you uh, represent. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share uh, my experience from Malawi. My name is Grant Schari. I'm the city engineer of Blanta. What, what normally happens in uh, developing countries is, is that uh, if you are not aware of uh, your, your law, you, you face indeed a lot of resistance from the community whenever you are executing uh, projects. But uh, I have good uh, references according to what I did last year and this current physical year. What was happening is that uh, uh, the government is uh, going through some reforms and uh, we are there to uh, improve quite a few roads uh, projects in our city of Planta. Uh, indeed, uh, involvement of the public and the, the stakeholders is really uh, important. What I actually did was to use the very same councillors for our city to inform the public about the land where they were encroaching so that they come out of the, all that uh, corridors so that they pave way for the construction works. Initially, those people, they were very, very, very resistant. But when the councillor was involved, telling them they were now getting that information and they, they could understand that. And at the very same time, we used to go at the uh, uh, TV media for the state, trying to tell the people that they should be going out of the road, road reserve. When the, the construction came, you found that uh, there are some pockets of people who try to be resistant. But uh, since we saw that the uh, law gives us the mandate to take them away, we couldn't have to be uh, very, very, very lenient to them. We, we have a, an enforcement team within our, our council. So we just go at night after informing them by daytime that please don't be here, otherwise we are going to demolish your property. So we had to do and follow that pro type of procedures. And up to now, nobody had to give us any other problems. And they gave up the, the road reserves and the roads where they were con constructed without any, uh, any uh, reimbursement at all. Similarly, the ESCOMO, the, that is a state-owned uh, uh, parastato, they also they have a tendency of installing power lines without consulting the uh, council. So uh, we had to negotiate with them to request uh, their power lines. It uh, gave them a very, very, very long way, a very long time. They gave a very long time to respond and to do that because they wanted the, to be compensated. But when we, we went into their act, you found that their, their very same act, it was very well elaborative that they were supposed to seek permission from us first. Now, when we discussed, there were quite a few uh, sections of the act. What we had to do now was just to write a very good letter, it's a very strong one, and actually citing those particular uh, uh, sections, plus some of the sections of the Local Government Act. And when we just wrote them that letter, copied to the uh, office of the president and a few ministers there, immediately they responded. So what, if you are aware of what you are doing and you know what the law provides for you, I know that there is a way things are done. They are done in Blanta. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, I guess, I guess the question out of that is, from, um, please forgive me if I've mis misinterpreted this, but basically there were some projects, people were alerted, but it seemed that it was a game of cat and mouse, that um, some authorities were circumventing the law, and that meant that people, the end users, I, I guess, would have been the losers on that. So even though the, the right things were being done informing communities, communities were still bypassed anyway. Would anyone care to respond to that? Monica. May I would like to give an example, which is maybe an indirect answer. And this is about political leadership and balancing interests. And I mentioned earlier that we need innovative approaches. So one of the, those which we have developed is the so-called Ecomobility World Festival. This is one month, one neighborhood, Ecomobile, which means no cars. Cars go out and people are attracted and supported in using their or executing their daily mobility in whatever different ways. And you can imagine that this causes discussions. So the first lesson we learned is a mayor must be behind this. No way if there is no clear political leadership. The second lesson what we learned, and we are now uh, preparing that in the, for the third time in, in Kaohsiung and Taiwan, the, the lessons what we have learned in the different processes uh, so far is that there are different interests and they are articulated and this is right so but when the administration or even the mayor him or herself goes and speaks to the people when the administration is present in the area then you find solutions and what seemed to be a conflict can be a win-win situation so for example a business person says i'm completely against this month because i want to reach my business with my lorry Okay, understandable. We are not saying that this business must be closed down for one month. Sitting together with that person, a solution was found how the lorries could for certain times go in. The person was completely satisfied. The entire project was not endangered. And from an opponent, we got a very strong supporter. But again, it is political leadership. It is a well-organized process. Is it willingness? And it is administration being close to people. And I don't say that against social media. I say that social media cannot, so to say, take over that presence and that speaking from people to people and to, to be, let's say, part of the process, even mm. as persons. But I guess the point that the gentleman was making was the duplicitousness of the authorities, bypassing people and effectively threatening them. And at the end of the day, they got what they wanted, but people were not reimbursed. It's a, well, it's a bad process. I mean, a, a risky process. Risky. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't always work. Is there anybody else who would like to put... The, the person over there, yep, there's a microphone. If you could introduce yourself and the organisation you represent, please. Sorry, we can't hear you. Can we working? adjust the microphone? I, hello, okay, now you can Yes, hear me. we can hear you, yes, that's um, great, thank you. Thank you very much, my name is Matthias Merford. I'm working for the German Development Agency, GIZ. Um, we are also a partner of the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative. And uh, thank you very much for giving your insights on public participation. I like very much uh, the statement of um, Mr. Lernroth at the beginning. We are very often talking about the how, um, uh, about the what to do, but not on uh, about the how to do. For this reason, we were sitting together on a Tuesday and Wednesday with um, about 60 uh, particular practitioners from, from a lot of African cities, but also from Latin America and Asia together, and we were particularly discussing that. Um, the topic of um, public participation uh, in, in Germany, or actually the lack of public participation uh, with a huge railway station has opened up a big field. And there now we had in a lot of cities very, very interesting uh, experiences uh, and different methods of public participation opened up. Other countries had that too. Uh, the European Union and others uh, have developed a lot of materials, a lot of like toolboxes on different participation measures. Um, but if it comes back to the, uh, to the experience on the ground, I would have two questions uh, to the panel here. So how to actually select the right uh, uh, method for participation or uh, maybe the question to address to Johannesburg and Stockholm. Um, how did you select the, the, the right method for participation? And then another question, how we can actually build up the capacity um, that uh, can moderate and that can advise local governments or how local governments themselves build up the capacity to conduct public participation. Thank you. Okay, so two questions there. So who would like to, to tackle those? In fact, we, we want, well, the, the, um, the gentleman referred to the experience of, of Sweden and Johannesburg. So 
Who goes first, Sweden or Johannesburg? <laughs> yeah, Johannesburg, Johannesburg can go first. So the first question there is, is how to select the right, I'm trying to read my, my handwriting here, the right participation method. Okay, if I'll try and answer this one. Uh, maybe, like, how do you get to select the right participants to maybe be part of the process? Mm. And the methodology, well, the, the means, you've got the participants, it's how, how you can actually, the, the right way to use them, so to speak, the right method, the right channel. Yeah, because once you've got them, like, you already have your stakeholders, maybe you wanted to check how do we communicate with them, or oh, I'm not sure if I get the question. Would you, would you like to repeat the question, the gentleman who raised it? Maybe try to explain it, uh, make it simple for me. Yeah, <laughs> and we, we have uh, heard a lot that there are different forms of participation. Yeah, you can conduct online participation, you can uh, bring together small round tables, you can have fill a big hall and uh, receive requests from the audience. So how did you do it in Johannesburg? Um, which kind of format of event uh, did you use uh, to uh, conduct your uh, participation process. Okay, no thanks, uh, now I understand. Yeah, I think with us, because we normally would go into communities and invite those particular stakeholders to come to a meeting where we would use the local language and address the project. What is it that we want, this project is going to help us achieve and how is the community going to benefit from it so that everybody understands and also what is it that we expect from them during the construction of the project and then maybe what are the benefits for the communities so that you do a proper needs analysis and then you inform them that uh, the project is why are you doing the project so that they understand but sometimes people just see things happening in their communities and they are not really involved they're not part of that so sometimes when you use uh, like like i said earlier on it's better if you you, you, you know your people, you know how to reach them. Mm. So use the proper channels to reach them and then address them in the language that they will understand. So normally we have what we call stakeholder consultation workshops that we conduct in communities that we are targeting for a particular project or program. Thanks. Okay, and the, the second part of the question, again, if the gentleman could explain it, you talked about building capacity. Can you, can you expand on that very, very briefly? Because I want to squeeze in some more uh, questions before mm -hmm. we close down the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay, the, the building up the capacity, it means that, the, that the, to enable the cities that they themselves find uh, the right methods, the right formats. Right. And um, so typically, w when I look from German cities, what they are doing, they often they don't know how to really do public participation or they have limited capacities in their administration or they have too many technical people and they don't have people that can actually talk with people uh, like you from uh, Johannesburg have explained and um, so the idea uh, so the question would be um, do we need to build up more small think tanks more uh, small consultancies right. um, that can help and support mm, to cities spur on the, the, yeah. the consultation process more think tanks yeah okay yeah I think what I want to say is that uh, you, like with us the whole consultation process is built into how government operates mm. in those communities we've got a system of what communities and also councillors in communities that can assist uh, organize communities so that you are able right, to so communicate your with them. Favors you in that sense. Yeah, and it's also in the constitution and in various legislation, like the legislation that governs uh, local municipalities, which is called uh, uh, Municipal Systems Act. In there, they've got uh, uh, integrated development plans which are like a five-year plan of projects that are going to happen in the communities. Once they, once they do that, it is expected of the municipality to consult the people in that community and to go out and consult, I mean, uh, conduct those public participation workshops so that they are, are going to have a proof that we have done this. So we need to do that and encourage that. And then at the same time, councillors, what councillors, and all of those things, sometimes they can be abused. So it's not like uh, they will always succeed. Sometimes there are challenges around these particular forums that are used to consult. You find that there are people who are using the same processes to their own advantage. So you must be careful how best to manage those. And at the same time, uh, once you use councillors and what committees, it means already you are 
with a, a political organization. Right. And then if you are with that particular political organization, you might lose out on people who are not necessarily members of that organization. So, so, so there are dynamics in, in different communities. Uh, you must try and work with them. And also from the, the expert side, you, you must not like come into communities bringing solutions to them. You must at least try to find out what is it that they want, what is it that they can do to be part of the process. In most cases, you find that you go to a place, you're saying you're going to do consultation, but already you're carrying that solution in your bag. If they don't agree with you, then we, you become very, very confused. Okay. So you need to watch out, watch out for those, 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 those things that I'm mentioning. Right, but at the same time, I mean, nothing's perfect. Just try and work around sure. it. Okay, I want to jump in because I'm conscious that time is very, very tight. I know that Miles would like to respond to that and also Monica. And then I want to throw, this, throw it back let, to the audience in the time available. Let, let me see if I can be brief. The, this, the key distinction between the what and the how is that the what is generic. It's what you teach at universities. You organize conferences about what to do. But you almost, when it comes to the how, it is always local. It's always local, which means you can't teach it. You can only learn it. Because it's all, it's all reflected in local political culture and in the local relationship between politicians and technical experts. If there's one thing you could say about capacity building in terms of public consultation in my, uh, and participation, in my view, the key people to be educated are the technical experts. The technical experts have to learn to talk to other people than themselves and their colleagues. Okay. <laughs> Please applaud him, feel free. <laughs> and, and Monica. Yeah, complimentary answer to that, capacity building. I'm deeply believing that all governmental institutions, specifically local and regional governments, have tasks in moderation and facilitation. That's different to 20, 30 years ago. But in our modern times, this is a genuine task of a local or regional government. Consequently, they need these respective skills. So we need in all of these local and regional governments, people in administration who are skilled in facilitation and moderation. They can then also help to look what are the best methods, and I fully agree that this has to do with the uh, local circumstances. In specific situations of very conflictual situations, an external moderator might be the much better choice than a person from that specific administration. But I want to highlight again, let's not discuss public participation mainly as something of having conflicts around one big infrastructure project. I know that this is the perception in the media, but we know so many well done processes on the local level where something is developed together. And I was talking about plans, but this can also be certain infrastructures where people say, these are the bus lines we need. These are the types of mobility we desire. And where service providers then can say, oh, maybe I can take this up and we come together to a solution. So this is a type of moderation and facilitation which is not necessarily around conflicts, but around finding joint solutions. Okay. I, I actually want to pick up on a point that um, Raphael made. I'd like to put it to you, the audience, because in his presentation, he, whilst he, he, he expressed his, 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 the importance of consultation, he also said that it shows discriminatory effects between modes of transport as well as class. Are, are any, apart from our friend in New Zealand, is there anybody else who is involved in transport planning who has encountered that? Would anyone like to respond to that point that he made? No, no response at all? Is there, this lady here, sorry, gentlemen, I do beg your pardon, I'm so sorry. Um, my name is Tommy Magnati. Hi. I'm uh, the head of transport authority in the city of Durban. Um, it is actually absolutely true. Um, part of that, look, is historical. Um, because if you consider the, uh, the free ride, so to speak, that um, motorists or car owners uh, enjoy, as opposed to uh, the public transport users, for instance, there is uh, an inequitable treatment that is built into the system there. But there has been uh, the case because the people that designs the roads, engineers like myself, we drive cars. Oh. We don't uh, 
uh, use public transport. So there's a look in, in, uh, so an inbuilt vision. There's an inbuilt look bias there. Yeah, tunnel vision, it's, basically. Yeah, exactly. Look, it is. Uh, it takes taking uh, stepping out of that to be able to appreciate the bigger role that you are required to look to play. Um, in aviation, I think look. <laughs> The, uh, the airlines often complain about uh, the treatment that they get, as opposed to other uh, users look of the um, airport infrastructure. So it is across the board. Um, and uh, engaging um, different stakeholders to find a, look, a, a good solution is not an easy uh, process at all. Mm. And uh, I do agree with the gentleman from Sweden that uh, as technocrats, we are ill-equipped to conduct uh, stakeholder engagement. Oh dear. I think, uh, look, we have to look to engage and look and bring on board people that can actual, actually um, handle stakeholder engagement. Sure. You, you uh, sound terribly distressed as you say this, so please, please don't worry. It's, it's not a crime <laughs> to be a technocrat. Don't no, apologize. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Look, it, it is the truth. Um, sure. Look, we, we, we're getting better at it now because we're being challenged. Mm. I mean, previously, look, if you were an engineer and you presented a technical solution, uh, you were treated like God. You could proceed. Right. In this day and age, it's no longer possible to do that. So it's, it's demystifying the, the technocrat that he... he okay, okay, so it's, we get that. Can I have a very quick response, starting with you, Manuela, because I'm conscious that we are coming to the end of our session, but Manuela, and then yes. work our way through the panel. I think that the most important thing is to think about multidisciplinary teams, because it's true that technicians sometimes are a little bit overwhelmed with their solutions and they think that is the only thing that can happen. And sometimes it's true, but it's important to be able to have people to help them to explain the, the, peop the common people about that solution in, in, in another terms, because you know technicians are sometimes uh, they speak in a very technical way. But I think that the solution is to have in, in, in the teams when the project start people that are not technicians that are able to understand the, the project and the solutions in a, in a more uh, a common way. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Monica, would you like to respond to that and yeah. we'll work our way through? I, I just thought what, what would be my last uh, <laughs> thought for you. And I would say, let's try to see all in a bigger perspective. Let's try to see a mobility planning or even a, a discussion around one infrastructure process project in the context, context of sustainable development, for example, in how we reach SDGs, in the context of what is our strategic plan for that particular city or region. Let's look into these processes also as educational processes in how administration can engage with citizens. So let's not only look what is now the time we need or the cost we need or how, how problematic it is or whatever. Let's see it as a process which educates the technical experts, the political leaders as well, and the citizens and all types of stakeholders towards a way on how our society is more uh, coherent and can work together well. Okay, so a holistic approach is required. Final word there to Jai Hak O, oh, please. Yes, your thoughts. I, I, I would like to, in my presentation, I mentioned about the importance of the uh, agreement. Huh? on rules and process signed by the, all the representatives of the, stock, the stakeholders. I think that, that is kind of the game rule and then abide by, abide by the, all the stakeholders. So the, we, we have to be very eff efficiently uh, this, the, discussed and then reached the solution. And also at the same time, I, I would like to mention about some the social equity. Mm, very briefly. And uh, inclusiveness, okay? So it's quite often, for example, the, the high school area project, some, some the lower class, lower income people are, get the disbenefit from the, lack, from the reduction of the conventional railway services, so for, for example. But the, those, the, what is the equity issue is not where the, what is the raised, uh, during the transportation planning and the decision making process. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. And Raphael. Um, in terms of, um, I, I guess the, 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 there, are, there are two things that I cannot. One is we spoke about how can we improve uh, 
the awareness, I guess, or you know, the consultation process plus being aware of are we doing the right thing or not. And, and, and I guess that, that can be done through different means, right? But you have to have a learning process through it, right? And you can do it through you know, uh, uh, fitness checks of, of what has worked, what hasn't worked, right? The example of the uh, Dutch tax, right? When they went and evaluated numbers, 400,000 less passengers in Amsterdam in one year, Right? So immediately they, they overturn it, right? So what, and then you have to go, what did we do wrong? Um, and I guess it was something that Commissioner Bulch uh, mentioned in her message earlier, and uh, which she mentioned that we need to establish certain KPIs. So we need to establish KPIs to be able to assess if we're in the right direction, right? Including, I would say, this issue that I highlighted, which is the potential discriminatory factors, right? Making um, uh, these, these differences in, in the way we approach things. And, and it costs society quite a lot, by the way. I mean, and, and if I can use again the example of the today being famously discussed Heathrow project, right? Because it's, it's, it's really a, 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 a unique case. I mean, it's, you know, we're discussing a third runway that will cost uh, about 20 billion pounds, right? So but it's gone up because of the delays, actually. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and the thing is that. In that 20 billion pound, compared to other modes of transport, it is included ground access, right? So the whole, the, commu the users will have to pay for highways, will have to pay for trains, will have to pay for everything else. So this is what I said, you know, is it to the best interest of mm. the users? Is it to the best interest of the community? Sure. Uh, we need to evaluate those things. Okay, so who gains in the end? And uh, the, a word there from um, Abraham Chego. If you could very briefly give uh, your take on this, please, the issue of discrimination, very briefly. Okay, <coughs> thank you. I, I do agree also with the method of like a uh, holistic approach that you take a social scientist who can help facilitate issues in the community so that you understand what their needs are. And then you bring along the technical people so that if they need to explain something, maybe they can do that and then we can simplify it to the people. And another thing is that uh, I was just in another session the other day and they said, sometimes you come up with a technical solution only to find that the problem is not really technical, it's social one. If maybe people need something this side of the road, maybe we can just give them the water that they need rather than to put a pedestrian crossing if they, because they only go there to, get, to, 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 to fetch water. But if there's no longer a need, then they won't be crossing the road all the time. Thank you. Okay, then. And Mans Lomra, finally, very brief word from you, please. The biggest problem, in my view, based on my experience from the Swedish government, is that the technical experts from these different silos don't talk to each other. That is why many, problems run into, many projects run into problems, that the technical experts from these different silos don't talk to each other. So the technical experts have to learn to talk to each other, and that would, and that would improve both decision making and proposals and would also improve public consultation. My final point, flippant one, is on air, air traffic taxes. I think air traffic should be taxed. It should be taxed. We should have an EU-wide tax on air transport. Thank you. Okay. Well, what can we say about that? But look, Mans Lorem, Manuela Lopez Menendez, <laughs> Jai Hak O, Rafael Schwarzman, Monica Zimmerman, and of course, Abram Chego. Thank you so much for joining us in this session, making it work. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't part company yet, because I know that many of you will be attending tonight's dinner. On your way to that dinner via the glass hall, you can watch some Saxon break dancers. I leave it to your imagination, but what I would say is that they're very, very good. They'll be performing at 6.50. You can join in if you want, but I wouldn't advise you if you have never breakdanced before in your life, and if you do decide to breakdance and you break something, don't look to us to compensate you because we're not insured for that. But have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining us today and for all your contributions for making it a successful session. Thank you, and thank you to our panel.